Good afternoon and good morning to uh, the people out there. This is Mark Stignani, and uh, I'm joined by Jacqueline Spertel. And uh, welcome to the presentation. Uh, I think let's, uh, Jacqueline, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Spertel, and I am a patent analytics specialist at uh, Black Hills IP. So today I'm going to be kind of um, coming at it from maybe a slightly different viewpoint than um, what Mark will bring, um, but I kind of come at it from how do we take data and analytics and, and help do some patent valuations um, from a data perspective. Yep. And as you can see here, I'm an analytics chair here at Schweigman. Uh, formerly, both Jacqueline and I did work for Thomson Reuters, so uh, to my friends in the information services business listening in, hello, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I've spent uh, a good portion of my IP career doing analytics and uh, also been very, very privileged to sit in the presence of a great minds uh, in the form of uh, NLP people and uh, other R&D scientists that, uh, that have, have helped me understand limitations of analytics as we go forward here. So um, let's move right along into, and one, one final disclaimer for, for my clients on, on the line here. Nothing about this has anything to do with any of you or any work that I've done with you and these are all my own opinions. So there's my disclo disclaimer. Um, <clears throat> all right, come on. There we go, whoops, too much, okay. Jeff. So today we'll be talking a little bit about four parts in our presentation. The first is what are some of the problems or challenges with algorithmic based valuations of patents? Um, and then what are algorithms or analytics, you know, not so good at and what are they good at? Um, and then lastly, we'll round it out with this suggested approach to uh, evaluating using analytics and algorithms. Want to go to the next one. So what are some of the challenges with patents? Um, first off, they have a lot of intrinsic value. So, you know, you see the text, you see the claims, see the images, you know, what kind of value? One person might value it at something else, another person might go, oh, this is too narrow, and, you know, we don't see a lot of value in it at all. Um, also, a lot of the times, patents can be really kind of cumbersome. Um, reading one alone, we've seen one where, you know, there's hundreds of pages of specification, and you're trying to comb through it for that one little nugget um, to determine whether or not it's a valuable patent for you. Um, and then if you times that, um, you know, time by, you know, a couple hundred patents, you could be spending months, think of it for litigation, reading through patents um, to find the information and to really give it some type of value. Um, also, patent claims can be very broad, and while from a prosecution standpoint, that's great, um, but when you're trying to value something, how do you know if, yes, you have a broad claim set, and maybe that's valuable in when you're purchasing, but maybe when you go to litigate, that broad might be attacked in litigation. Um, and then patents also require tending. Things you only have a certain amount of time and then they have to go into the public domain. So you want to be able to use them and get the value out of it before they expire. And one thing I want to leave uh, with the, the viewers' memories here is the word images. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later, talking about how analytics deals with images and patents. So I uh, just want to call that out. Another problem with patents is that one patent to one target is a very different approach than uh, the same patent to another target. Um, what's not valuable, what's valuable, it, it's very, very hard to tell what one patent is universally around. I mean, for those looking at patents, uh, like you know, for instance, Amazon's patents coming up for ex expiration here, um, assessing what's valuable is really uh, a very subjective process. Um, design around, and many times is, is, is available depending on how someone puts something in Together. And also a lot of what they have <clears throat> patented, a lot of times just isn't plain old detectable uh, by, by the casual observer. You have to get, actually get into somebody's product and tear it apart before you can kind of find those bits and pieces. And then finally. Yeah, so another challenge with patents is the cost. Uh, for anyone who's, you know, tried to um, prosecute a patent and maintain a patent, um, you know what I'm talking about, and Mark and I have done plenty of that. Um, and, you know, some key points here, the bad patents cost just as much as the good patents. So the ones where you spent 
hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially, um, protecting it in several different countries, and then suddenly that product line is no longer valuable. Um, you know, that costs just as much as, you know, another line of products that took off and you never thought it was going to go anywhere. Um, but it does seem one common thread is everyone seems to not let go of what we call bad patents or patents where there's no longer any use to the company. They think at some point, you know, you put it out in the trash can and someone's going to pick it up and say, yep, we found value in it and they're going to make that million dollar product off that idea and run with it. Um, so everyone wants to keep going. And when they do that, what they start realizing is it's going to get into this called twilight zone. The cost to maintain are going to go up. You have to pay to renew it or to keep prosecution going on it. And then since those costs are going up, you have to balance your overall budget and you say, well, maybe we don't do as many new filings. And maybe that one little idea that that R&D person had um, doesn't get a patent filing on it because you didn't have anything in your budget. And all that comes around when we talk about money is, why do we have to pay for human analysis when there's so many algorithms out there? And so that's where we'll start talking a little bit more how algorithms come into play. Yeah. So, I mean, just a rough set of categories here about the types of um, uh, algorithms that, that uh, different systems use to uh, identify value or, or statistical value, I should say, in, uh, in various sets of patents. I mean, we have clustering where, uh, you know, there's a, a uh, an automated clustering that you're based upon keywords that you're, you're harmonizing on. You could be categorization, uh, either using uh, an agreed upon uh, category system like the, uh, the uh, CPC or the IPC or the you know, US uh, patent classification. Uh, algorithm is very good at comparing and cross-referencing one matter against the other especially where you've got a bunch of fielded data. They're pretty good at sorting things, you know, how many words, sort this by how many words are in the independent claim or how many things are in the independent claim that are unique words. Uh, they're fairly good at, and once they've been trained, and we'll talk more about training later, about suggestions. You can actually have uh, software algorithms that sort and suggest with a, with a high degree of precision and recall uh, things that you, that you want to understand. Uh, they're also very good at statistically presenting things that are fielded data in a, in a, patent, a bunch of patent classes and, uh, and, and predominantly that. So, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about those. And, uh, Jack, you had something on data collection? I did. And so what Mark just listed are, you know, some more sophisticated algorithms and what they do for evaluating. And in, in, in my business, a lot of what I use algorithms or kind of analytics for is to get initially that data collection. Um, so for example, I've done several things where we do data validation. So a customer has a set of data, we um, then go out and grab it publicly. So we use algorithms to kind of grab that collection of data and do some basic analysis um, on there. So sometimes I use, you know, the algorithms on a very, you know, baseline sense, and then that can play into the other things Mark just mentioned. Great. So let's start what algorithms, I mean, not just do poorly, but they actually are terrible at. Um, algorithms don't provide a real valuation of patent. I mean, and I really want to stress this. Anybody who gives you a patent strength or a patent score or something there, it's just an amalgamation of statistical evidence that may or may not, might be useful, may not be useful. Um, so almost everything on this list is subjective. Uh, with, a, with some of the stuff at the end being a little more objective. But, you know, patents algorithms don't tell you how much a particular target would might pay for a patent. Uh, it does not tell you subjectively how broad a claim is. You can, <clears throat> there are algorithms out there to judge whether a claim is broad or not, but it can't tell you if it's broad and it's, you know, fits the product you're trying to, you know, address evidence of use on. It's not going to tell you whether they win litigation or whether someone will go forward and license a patent. And it won't, and you know, and that's the thing is that the, the, the patent valuation is still a very, very subjective art form rather than the science at this point. And so uh, we use uh, a lot of the statistical and clustering algorithms to help us start at the most important uh, thing statistically and to help us, you know, find something that wins us faster than having to sort through the whole bucket. Jack, can you add some other things here? 
Yeah. So kind of the bottom two, and again, you know, Mark was kind of coming at it from a patent valuation standpoint, and I'm almost kind of at the beginning stages of, you know, before you can evaluate a patent, you want to kind of make sure your data is there. So again, this whole comparing data and fields, if you don't have the right filing date, um, which may again go off of some other deadlines, um, that definitely can affect the valuation of a patent. Um, also things too, when you're divesting and you try to figure out the valuation, um, if you have some, you know, assignment and knowing, you know, the current patent owner, um, again, the algorithm can help you get there a little bit, but they're not always be able to tell you those nuances of if there's a chain of title that's really messy, can the algorithm properly determine that this is the current owner? And that's a constant problem, um, especially when you have a lot of acquisition going and a lot of merger a portfolio sometimes there's or not sometimes most times there's always an error in assignment chains that that needs to go back and be repaired before you go into litigation so yeah i've never had a clean data set yeah so um one of the ways that algorithms are mostly uh set up here is they use training algorithms they, you, you basically use su subject matter experts humans uh in general that uh, provide uh, what is called a gold data set. And they go through and they sort documents and then you sit there and you put your algorithm on top of that and your algorithm learns uh, statistically how that, how that goes forward, how that should be selected, how that should be sorted. Um, Watson, I'm gonna bring up a little later because I've had a number of people asking me about Watson and, and, and patent analytics and we'll cover that a bit more later. Um, <clears throat> but you know, algorithms are really much better when they're trained in, uh, you know, especially in the topics that you're looking in. So uh, the, the problem with patent valuation is nobody has done a good training set of, of patents and how much they're worth. Uh, and you can go harvest statistical, but very few people tell you how much they actually paid for a patent. Uh, and there's very, very few sources of good <clears throat> statistical evidence of what a particular patent is worth and why it was paid for. So just different ways that you can do training here in, in the matter. Um, Jump on Watson for a few seconds here. Um, this is just a full chart of Watson. The part I wanted to bring up attention to that the, there's a small little button down there called trained models. So uh, Watson, of, of many things it is, is not, it's a very good uh, savant-like uh, algorithm that can you know, whip through things that it's been trained on. I and mean, it runs through all the different variations, all different various sets. And as long as the model is good, um, the results come up and better in, in a higher uh, format and training. An example how a poorly trained Watson model looks here, there's a, there's a, a URL out there that allows you to you know, put images into Watson and, and see what uh, Watson thinks they are. You know, here's one where Watson can't tell the difference between a, a barn owl, they think it's an animal, they have high confidence it might be a cow, and you know, slightly less confidence it's a bird. So, uh, this is this is kind of the current state of the art when it comes to image recognition. And you remember, images are a full third of your review process in the in the patents as well, just to make sure you're in the right right ballpark. Uh, you know, another thing that happens when you don't train it, I just uh, stuck um, a patent drawing of a fairly easily recognizable product into Watson and saw what came out there. And uh, the Watson tool came out with, uh, yeah, well, we think it's a study. You, know, you, you definitely know it's gray. And then they have the audacity to ask, uh, did we wow you at the end of that? So as you can see, not quite ready for prime time in this whole area of things. So this is just, you know, as an example, where the, the perceived peak of analytics is right now is it's not very far. So, um, but Mark, you could just keep feeding those patents into Watson and then it would be great. Mm -hmm. We'll sure replace all of us, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, you know, I, I'm not worried about that for a very, very long time. And, I, you know, for the listeners here, I am coming at this from a law firm perspective. Uh, you know, so I, I certainly uh, am looking at these things as far as risk and risk mitigation purposes as well. So now let's move on to what algorithms do well. Jacqueline, did you want to do that? Yeah. Mine? Okay. Nope, that's absolutely mine. So there are definitely things that algorithms do well. And here we touched upon them earlier, but clustering words. Um, finding patterns, claims versus, you know, other claims, similarity, um, even citation impact. That one, actually, I really enjoyed the citation impact, figuring out whether or not it came from an examiner, an IDS, um, how many citations that that particular patent um, has, you know, had cited to it. 
Um, those are all great. And overall portfolio statistics, um, I use that a lot when, you know, people are trying to figure out from a competitor standpoint, you know, how many do they have? What countries do they file in? Um, what's their filing trends look like over the years? Um, you know, even being able to categorize a product, so using a combination of these, finding patterns. So they're, you know, finding a category, categorizing and then figuring out the statistics for those. Um, but really for me, what I think algorithms do well um, and happens with me a lot is data comparisons. So Mark was mentioning he comes at it from a law firm, law firm perspective, but I come at it more from customers coming to us. They have projects a lot that, you know, if they're in-house counsel, you know, they have time to maybe do some in-house prosecution and manage portfolios, not necessarily do projects of, is our data correct? And if their data is correct, then obviously the value to them goes up for several reasons. Um, so they'll come to me and say, hey, we have some data. Um, and, you know, it'll be my job to go out and verify whether or not that data is correct. I'll definitely use algorithms to go find me that data and do a comparison of, do I have the same filing date that my customer does? And if I do, that's a quick win for me to say, yep, I agree, it's correct. Um, but where, you know, my expertise comes into play is I get to say when it doesn't match, I'm the one making that final decision as what is the filing date. So you get the expertise of a human, but you get uh, the algorithm to get you kind of 80% of the way. Yeah, there's, there's lovely, you know, a lot of these things come up with very lovely metrics. So you can look at, uh, you know, a number of things and give some relatively objective, per, you know, performance comparison uh, as you're doing, you know, using algorithms as well to help you find things that might be of value. Um, <clears throat> So let's see, oops, did I do that? Okay, there we go. So what do we use algorithms for? I use them to get a starting point going. I look for uh, kind of a speed dating view of the world and give me everything that looks like this pattern semantically or above this certain threshold of similarity in a, in a statistical evidence situation. After or before specific data, I've been looking for prior art or in, infringing behavior that's been cited, you know, citation impact, that's been cited more times by the examiners in our unit 3628 in regards to a 101 rejection, or analysis rejection, had been litigated or challenged by an IPR. Uh, we also use it to gather in both data. And I think Jacqueline, that, that's, that, that's more of your point there uh, in that yeah. as well. But I mean, yeah, we use it for, you know, we use it to get started fast and not charge a lot to our clients. Uh, in, in the first deliverables that we put in front of them to, to establish the value proposition of what we do. Yeah, and the last one I touched upon it earlier about this assignment and determining ownership is there's definitely a place for algorithms to go out and, you know, look at the assignment data um, and try to determine who they think owns it. Because what it can do is it can narrow down the field of for assessing 7,000 patents for ownership. Um, we can take a look and go, yeah, that reasonably looks like that should be the owner and we can narrow it down and go, okay, this is the subset I really want to look into. I don't think the algorithm did it correctly. Um, so it does definitely um, make the time more efficient and our um, product in the end more reliable. Yeah. And so um, this is another thing doing, especially when we're doing M&A uh, analysis for a client on a target. Uh, one of the things that we can do is look for, you know, asset impairment, things where we're missing assignments. Uh, we might have uh, trade secret issues where, you know, former, you know, high profile inventors are working for the next employer who's a competitor. So um, we're able to give prosecution metrics on whether or not, uh, you know, a patent has had a lot of RCEs. We want to look at pr prosecution history estoppel for those or how many office actions, how many restrictions is, you know, if we're doing continuation mining of a, of a of a patent portfolio and trying to increase the value. We can look at the number of restrictions, see if something else was left on the table during restriction practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's the, the algorithms are very, very helpful in this. And all this relates into value. Uh, in, but you know, each one is a single little, little facet that you know, somebody has to cobble together. And Jacqueline, you had a... Yeah, I no. did. And I want to touch on a few more points that you had on that missing and incomplete assignments. Um, I see this more often than not that uh, a customer will come to us and say, we know we filed all of these assignments um, for these hundred, but go ahead and, you know, confirm that we did. And I'll come back and say, well, only 75 of them did. And they go, oh, no, I pointed to this. And they get confused on applicant versus um, 
assignee or assignor um, in the assignment. So if it's not filed through the assignment database, it's not recorded. So for example, if you'd filed the assignment with the application, it might be in pair, but it is not at the assignment branch. Um, so it's not recorded and on notice. So that's kind of an education that I've had with several customers on that. And then they really recognize uh, the additional value um, you know, that kind of the subject matter expert can bring to that. On prosecution metrics, uh, Mark, you pointed out a couple of examples, but I had another customer who did it when they were um, divesting. They wanted to make sure that when they divested a certain set of patents that it had an equal set of patents from their standpoint for valuation. Um, so, you know, if they had you know, 10 patents that had several RCEs that they were splitting that properly between um, the two divesting companies on that. Um, so that was a very interesting project. Um, it was great to see kind of that metrics matrix. Um, and the last one here for me, um, I know most people don't think about this for asset impairment, but again, if you don't have the basics down of your dates and your data, um, this can definitely affect um, your renewal due dates and your prosecution deadlines. And Obviously, if you miss those and they go abandoned, um, uh, you can pay more money to revive or you end up abandoning something that could be of uh, intrinsic value to you. Yep. And the uh, you know, one other thing that Jacqueline was talking about here is that uh, we also have the, uh, the aspect of uh, you know, looking at, looking at the, the performance of uh, various and sundry law firms as well. You know, you know, you're able to judge uh, you know, which law firm has been doing a better job at certain classes of patents and so forth and so on. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to say that it's an objective measurement because I mean, each patent is different and hard to do, but uh, we are able to, you know, again, pull up and see, uh, you know, especially when you're looking at an asset, uh, asset uh, purchase of a, of a competitor or a target company that, you know, how the law firms, did the law firms do their job or did they do it well uh, is also something we can use algorithms to do in assessing the value of a portfolio. So, ultimately, subject matter necess is, is necessary, it's ubiquitous. Um, because patents say things in ambiguous or less than clear format, so we don't, we don't draw really clear lines in the claim world, uh, being able to tell whether a patent covers tech X or tech Y requires subject matter expertise. Um, all of these things that I've got up here, I'm not gonna read them off, but it really has uh, it has a great deal of subjectiveness and subject matter expertise required to answer these well and, and clearly. Uh, we always use subject matter expertise as supported by machine technology because we find that the machine does lots of things very, very well, like sorting, categorizing, clear, you know, checking for this and that and the other thing. Whereas someone who's actually got to read the important paragraphs of the, uh, of the, the patent and, and compare them with the important pictures and compare them with the important claims is, <clears throat> is still a very much a human process. And, uh, and, and so we, we really, really caution, I really, really caution uh, on simple statistical measurements of whether a patent is covering someone or not. Uh, because it really comes down to a, a you know, the all elements rule on two fingers. Does this, this element is in claim equal the element that's in the product that I'm looking to assert a patent against? Jacqueline? Yeah, all I would add to that is I always think about it that an algorithm is going to get us 80% of the way. Um, and it's up to the subject matter expert to, you know, get that extra 20% because what that 20% brings is understanding and context to the situation. The algorithm or the analytics tools that you're using do not understand that you're using, you know, I go back to my assignment stuff, that you're trying to divest and overall understanding what you're trying to get at. And so therefore, how you take that data and how you deliver it could be different if it's an acquisition versus a divestiture versus data verification. Um, so there always needs to be that human component. Um, and definitely a subject matter expert is the way to go um, on it. And, and I think understanding um, really gets you the best quality product. Absolutely. So... Uh, we're going to give kind of our suggested approach to uh, analytics-supported patent valuation. Um, uh, surprise, surprise, it's different for each target product or company you're going for. So 
Uh, we like to use machine processes to identify prospects using you know, mechanical, statistical, and, and semantic means. Uh, but then we, once we, get the, we look at the targets and you know, evidence of use, uh, that really starts to you know, drop us into a human assist because uh, absent is a direct compare uh, and uh, you know, kind of a rare word extraction of a, uh, of a uh, marketing brochure that directly matches up against claims uh, there by machine, you know, someone's got to read this stuff. And, and, and we have lots and lots of ways of bringing synonyms and uh, claim fragments and things that are, are easily meaningful and clusterable to the use of machines. But then uh, at the end of the day, the subject matter expert, uh, at least at the law firm, has to kind of bring things together and say, yeah, better or worse or not so much. Uh, then once we have those high potential matters segmented out, uh, we begin mapping those out. We have, uh, you know, we've developed our own technology that lets us speedily map, uh, you know, products and claims against uh, specifications and non-patent subject matter. Uh, so it helps us map against the, the product first, then map against the portfolio. Secondly, if there's a, a friendly assertion or a, a licensing uh, thing to go into play. Uh, but once that's all done, we just, once we tell you how big something is, how, how you can or can't design around it, whether you can detect it or not, this is when you know, we, we want to suggest you hire someone who actually is you know, in the accounting space and does evaluation as a, as a general practice as well, because the professional evaluation of the matters that matter is both a legal and a fiscal activity. So, uh, you know, this is why we, we, we don't feel very good about saying one statistical analysis is going to tell you what your, your patent is worth. And I think that anything, anyone that says so uh, has a lot of you know, talking to do, hand waving to do to prove it. And then we go back and we run to repeat for the next target. It's, it's, it, 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 one size fits one in, in, in our view of uh, analytics support of patent evaluation. We just give you a better result than someone who just goes strictly to the fiscal expert because we tell which ones actually have the ability to be asserted. Jacqueline? Yeah, and from you know my view of the world, um, a lot of the times I'm even one step removed and that is I'm just there to provide as much objectivity to the situation as possible. So, you know, for me, I may understand that a divestiture is happening or an acquisition is happening, therefore, that's how I'm doing this assignment. Um, but the outcome of that, I'm not tied to that. So I just produce the data and I explain it and it is up to the company or the client to kind of interpret that the way they need to for their product. So my objective is to get a deliverable that they can act upon and that they don't have to do anything else but take a look at that and make a decision, an informed decision. And so with you know a certain level of expertise and understanding, you can get that to the customer in an efficient way and then they can make their decision um, because of course that's not their everyday job is to evaluate patents. Normally people have several other things on their plate if they're still managing other portfolios or things of that nature. Um, so, you know, they want to be able to make a quick decision, but an informed decision. Um, so from my standpoint of doing a lot of data verification and assignment um, work, that's really what I kind of value um, my job and the role that I think I play um, for my customers. Great. And uh, this is where we're at the close of our formal remarks here, and I want to you know open it up for questions here. But uh, did have one come through as I was I was listening to Jacqueline close out here. Um, we also do these things uh, to look at you know kind of deadlines, patent term extensions, and, and terminal disclosures, uh, disclaimers, excuse me, as well uh, as we're bringing portfolios in for M and A work, um, simply because a lot of times that you know because it's so hard to keep things alive when you need to keep them alive and keep track of what, what additional days you have on something. Uh, we also use Onlyx to help pull out uh, PTA and, and uh, TDs in, in our pair data as well. So, uh, and so with that, I mean, I'd like to open uh, the floor for questions, uh, you know, suggestions. Uh, I mean, we have, a, we have a good number of you out there. Uh, so if you have any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, uh, I appreciate your time and patience in listening to us. Oops. Are there any uh, 
Questions? I'm not able to see the, whether there's questions up or not. Uh, Chris, can you can you, you speak on if, if you see them? I can see it as well, Mark, and we don't have okay. any at the moment. We must have explained it perfectly. Yep, or, well, anyway, give us a couple more minutes. I think we, well, I did see one pop up here, I thought. Um, any comments about pharma patents and supplemental protection specifics filings? Uh, yeah, well, at this point, that's not something you've actually gotten in, you know, we've gone out and built analytics to pull out yet, so that's still pretty much a hand job to bring things uh, for the supplemental protection certificate filings and that sort of So that has not been brought in. I'm actually not aware of anybody in the commercial side that has, has uh, uh, done any of that. But, you know, if, if you'd like to follow up with me uh, directly, uh, I'm happy to, you know, take, take that on phone call. We can talk about that in specific. But uh, in general, for pharma, we're not uh, there. Uh, what does SME stand for? Subject matter expert. So that's somebody who knows what they're doing in the area of technology. Um, anybody else have questions? Okay. And uh, you know, basically anybody who's interested in talking to us, oh. Okay, uh, we have another question here. Uh, one time we hear on there's a ballpark comment, a number on what a patent is worth, 100K to 200K for mechanical electrical. Uh, there is a couple different websites out there that uh, regularly publish what they think uh, the average value of a patent for sale is worth. And it runs between 100K and 200K. I think it's down significantly in the last two quarters. Um, but they, they, on a quarterly basis, have published a number of statistics around what a patent is worth. So I believe that would be the, the basis for that opinion. Uh, you know, I think uh, the better way is a patent is worth exactly how much someone is willing to pay for it to either avoid a lawsuit or uh, to step forward into a, uh, a, a comfortable licensing situation. Uh, I have another viewer who's asking about any comments on demand letters. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing in the analytical space is yet there. If we have a demand letter, though that we can take if there's a, a an identified patent and an identified product we have a very, way of very very quickly overlaying the demand and, and any claims uh, claims made in that demand with against the uh, the granted matter and uh, the accused product so you know on, on, on about 30 minutes or 40 minutes notice uh, we can compare one matter to one demand letter uh, you know, in a fairly fast format. Uh, don't call me on that time, but it's very fast. It's under a day uh, in that respect. Uh, Jacqueline, anything you want to do? Um, a follow on question. You're doing great, so I'm going to let you I'm keep rolling. Great. Follow on question uh, back on the evaluation of the patent. Uh, my guess is that's live data that they, they put up there in the PowerPoint. I, I will actually share with you that source, uh, you know. And uh, we can uh, we can argue over whether that's a valid source or not. Um, yeah, but Mark, then, from our I mean, our opinions on you know our yeah. previous roles. I mean, it's at least a nice ballpark. I mean, it by oh, no it is. means is the end all be all. But I think even from you know our expertise, I'd say that ballpark between one to two k, if you're going to go international on filings, is definitely mm -hmm. a nice way to get some numbers around it. Yeah, and it's, it's also, uh, it's certainly at least the cost of replacement if you have an international patent family as well. So um, I have another comment about, comment on using algorithms to help define white space in a technology. Here's the problem with white space. White space is a negative space. What is not claimed? So an algorithm that tries to figure out what's not claimed is, uh, I've yet to find an algorithm that, that knows what nothing is. Uh, so that's you know the, the the whole. Whenever someone uses white space, I have to ask them very clearly what they mean because when I do white space analysis, I come together with an ontology of questions for the people who are looking at the white space and th what they think they want to find. So if I can say uh, I want to go into the space of uh, you know fracking and I want to know what the white space is in someone using this type of fracking slurry, this type of uh, fracking material, 
and this type of a borehole in what direction it's going in, then I can, you know, you know, make the ocean small enough to boil that we can do a white space analysis. Then we can ask questions tangibly for uh, an algorithm to help me, help me, help me out on that. Um, so that that's the problem with algorithms in white space is that if you don't define white space as what's missing, uh, then that's not white space. So I, I don't think algorithms do a great job of it unless they've been construed in such a way. Um, I've asked to uh, summarize the following. Uh, we cannot avoid the hard work of analyzing patents on a patent by patent basis, but algorithms will assist us in reducing those numbers in which we would start the analysis. I think that's a fair way to do it. Um, analytics give us high potential starting points. Uh, many times, and we've been very disappointed by high potential starting points, but at least it helps us start to talk about something. I mean, there's, you know, citation impact shows us what the examiner's valued. Uh, when you're doing, you know, examiner citation impact, um, and so that's uh, in, in many ways, I think that humans who are assisted by analytics are much more precise and and, and defendable than humans that don't do analytics and simply do, do subjective analysis. And then uh, analytics by themselves do not do an adequate job of providing an understanding the value of a, of, a, of an organization's IP. And Mark, a lot of the times I'll use this example. Um, so I think, of my, I think of Apple, right? I have several customers who will come and say, well, I want to know what Apple's doing. Um, that's, that's a very broad statement, right? So how do we narrow that down? And so, you know, algorithms can help us saying, okay, by classification and categorizing that, we can say, okay, are you into hardware? Are you into software patents for Apple? And then we can narrow it down into the certain technology classes that might be important to them. And then we narrow that with the, uh, you know, classifications and then it's Apple. Um, and then we can start taking a look at things. Maybe we look, start looking at title and narrowing it down. So when we are going patent by patent to evaluate it, we're not wasting our client or our customer's time looking at 10,000 patents. Maybe we've narrowed it down to 1,000. So our role a lot of the time with Mark and myself is to provide the value um, to a small subset and not to a large amount. So using us to help narrow down that. Yeah. And, and so what we're trying to do is very, be very efficient with our clients' money. I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're, we're going to do, you know, here's the best starting points. If, and, and if nothing ends up panning out in the high potential ones, uh, then we have a second tier that we can go back and start looking at. Uh, but you know, the one thing that we're still waiting for is, is you know, something like a Watson that can can you know, make that intuitive leap and say, you know, something that doesn't exactly mean something, uh, and I don't have the thesaurus to do it. And uh, that we have we have a best guess that this is th these two things are related. Uh, analytics do a very good job of correlating one thing to one thing, but uh, the subject matter expert is required to say that that's meaningful. I mean, there was there's. Uh, Lots of different statistical jokes out there about you know correlating two unrelated things there and having a high correlation of it, and sometimes it just is. So it doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in uh, to my audience and to Jacqueline. Thank you so much for work doing this with me, and uh, I, you know, I'm very happy to follow up and answer any other questions you have. The firm's website's SLWIP. I'm in there. I'm easy to find them on LinkedIn. And uh Mark, two things. Um, one, we should talk about what the next um, webinar is, but um, we got one last question very quickly. Is there a consensus that a patent that has many family members is more valuable than a more narrow scope of protection? Um, I, honestly, you're probably going to get, if you had 10 subject matter experts, you're going to get 12 opinions on this. Um, I think it depends what your overall objective is. Um, if you want um, a lot of protection, so if your idea um, or your customer's idea, um, you want it to be protected worldwide, then obviously having a lot of family members, if cost were no <laughs> object there, um, having a lot of family members and filing in several countries is the way to go and that's more valuable for them. But sometimes having a very narrow scope of protection um, on that and they're, you know, very precise with their money and they know where they want to be. Um, sometimes that can also be valued for that customer very highly because they got exactly what they wanted um, and they swap that out for 
protection in other countries. Uh, Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Or Yeah, there is a consensus that the company that filed with many, many patent members believed it to be valuable. Um, but one thing that I've found in analyzing many, many patent families is that unless you do your mapping of your claims as you're putting these things through the prosecution, um, there's a huge number of family members out there that virtually claim the same identical thing. I mean, the, the, the claim, the claim fragments are literally cut, cut and pasted together and there's one little nudge or one little nuance that's turned left or right. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of patents that have many, many family members that somebody spent a billion dollars to, to protect worldwide uh, that honestly, I don't think they're worth the, even the price of replacement on. So, uh, so I, I find that that, that consensus is more informed by statistics than it is informed by actual real claim scope. I hope that answers your question. All right, and I'll see you the next one there. Please join us. Um, these are a lot of fun to do. And uh, I, I think that, oh, we've got one more here. Oh, that's just the thing. We're, we're very popular. Oh. Yes. So uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just give us a call at the, at the firm or, or at Black Hills. Happy to answer any questions uh, and clarify anything you said. Appreciate your time. Thank you.